up. Uh, you brought a Bible? Yeah. I'd like for you to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. I'm going to teach from a familiar passage, but I'm going to take it in a little different direction. We're going to deal with the parable of the prodigal son. The parable of the prodigal son. Again, like I said, it's a familiar passage. I've taught on it several times. Prodigal, that's what he's referred to. Prodigal means wasteful. That's basically what the word means, wasteful. It means to be self-indulgent, to be selfish, to be irresponsible, uh, to be intemperate. It means to be wanton. So we're going to look at this parable of the prodigal son, and then we'll draw, I think, what will be, hopefully, some interesting parallels. Um, so Luke 15, we'll begin in verse 11. Jesus is teaching, and he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. By the way, that's where we all were, you know, lost. We were all lost. We were in one pig pen or another. But now he is found, and they began to be merry. Now his eldest son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and said, What these things meant? And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. You didn't kill the fatted calf for me. But as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots... Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. It's the story, the prodigal son of a young man who was raised right. He was raised in a home that we would consider a loving home, a father. The mother isn't mentioned, but obviously a, a loving mother, a, a loving household. And yet, 
something was restless in this young man. And though he was raised right, rebellion stirred up in his heart where he rebelled against the rules of his father. And, you know, there is a spirit of restlessness in the world where, where people are empty and they're just searching for something that would make them happy or something that would give them fulfillment. And the world allures, you know, the world outside. It's always trying to allure and entice people away from the father's house. And into the world so that, hey, don't miss all that the world has to offer because it's got so much to offer, right? Of course, to go out and indulge in what the world has to offer, you have to cast off the yoke, cast off the rules, cast off the oversight of your father, cast off the upbringing that you had. Uh, of course, you know, when you're young and you're restless, and all your father's rules are stupid anyway. You know, all those rules. I mean, that they don't realize they're there for a reason and that they're not to stifle your fun. They're guardrails to preserve you from falling off the edge of the cliff and destroying yourself. So we read this parable, and it's all so relevant because I think to some degree or other we've all been there. We were all lost and have been found, there's, there's no exceptions because you know you're born lost and you have to be found. Uh, you don't have to do anything to go to hell. Just continue like you are. Continue as is. You don't have to do a single thing. You're going to hell. But you do have to do something to go to heaven. And uh, to get to heaven, you know, you can't just show up. You're going to need a reservation. You're going to need a reservation, and when you get there, it's kind of like getting to the desk at a hotel. I mean, let, I can use this. It's a pitiful analogy, but you get to the desk at the hotel, and uh, they say, can I help you? Yeah, I got a reservation. Let's see if your name's in the book. Let's see if your name's here. Revelation 20 says, if your name's not written in the book of life, then... All whose names were not written, Revelation 20, in the book of life, were cast into the lake of fire. So the most important thing you can do in this life is to make sure your name is in that book. Is your name in the book of life? Have you made a reservation? You can't just show up. You know, people die. They think, well, I should be okay. I should be okay. I'm going to, I think I'll go to heaven. I'm a pretty good person. I don't kill people. I never killed nobody, never robbed a single bank, so I'm going to be okay. Think you can just show up at heaven's gates? You're going to need a reservation. And the only way to get your name in that book is to call upon the Lamb of God who was slain for you from the foundation of the world and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to put your name in his book. That's the only way. Lord Jesus, have mercy on my soul. Put my name in your book, Lord Jesus. Well, this is a relevant parable to all of us. We can all identify with it. But you know, through the centuries, there have been some interesting uh, interpretations or, let's say, alternate views of this particular parable. For instance... Uh, according to one interpretation, the two sons here, there's two sons, and then there's the father. Of course, the father represents God the Father. And the two sons, one represents Israel, the older son, and the other represents the Gentile church. The Gentile church is everybody that's not a Jew. Everybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile and, but this specifically speaks of the Gentile church. And, and, and here's the idea. The Gentiles were like the prodigal son. The Gentiles, the heathen. They were self-indulgent, selfish, drunken, immoral, ungodly, idolatrous, like, like the prodigal son. But they repent. We're talking about the Gentile church now, right? They, 
Gentiles. That's you and me. We repent. We return. We go to God for forgiveness. He forgives. He welcomes us like, this is my son. The Jews, the older son, were not very happy with that. That God would extend grace to the Gentiles. Y'all following this illustration? This is a very common, very well-established interpretation uh, that the, the Gentiles, the, the Christians that received Christ, all, all, they are represented by the prodigal son. They were lost and now found, and the staid, uh, reserved, angry older brother represented the Jews who resented the Christian church rising up thinking that they are now God's people uh, some kind of way, you know, much to the dismay of the elder brother. So I can see that that's uh, an interesting parallel. Uh, I would like to give you another parallel today. Uh, something to think about. It's been on my mind a little bit, and uh, I believe I can see in some ways, maybe in many ways, that this prodigal son is a lot like America. Now, there's a way that I believe we can see that the United States of America, our country, in some ways is a lot like this prodigal son. You say, well, how so? Because I don't know that I see that. Well, first, first, let's consider this fact. The house of the prodigal son, where he grew up, his father's house, is very blessed. He grew up in a blessed place. That's, I think, implicit in the entire story uh, because, first of all, there is a significant inheritance that's involved here. He says, uh, you know, give me what falls out to me. Give me my share of the inheritance. There is obviously a substantial inheritance involved. As we would see in verse, what's that, verse 12, give me the portion of goods that falls out to me. Also, in his father's house, he was sheltered from most of the hardships of the rest of the world. A lot like America. You see, you grew up here, you grew up in a blessed place. You grew up in a land of plenty. You grew up in a land where there is not mass starvation. You grew up in a land where people flourish. I mean, even the poor here are more blessed than, than many in most of the rest of the world. You grew up in a blessed place, like the prodigal son. You, if you grew up here, then you were protected and sheltered from most of the hardships that much of the world goes through. We haven't had massive widespread famine here. We have not, we've been preserved from that. We haven't had the kind of strife that exists in Muslim countries where they're war-torn constantly, one group killing the other constantly. We don't live in a barren wasteland. We really have been preserved. We have been sheltered. So that we, we don't even know what goes on in much of the world. It's, it's a shame, but our news is pathetic. Our news channels are, are an embarrassment. They are an embarrassment. They should be embarrassed. That they don't give us actual news. Uh, also, let's consider that we know the father in the parable of the prodigal son, we know the father had many servants, and those many servants were all blessed. I mean, he talks about that. If you notice in verse 17, he says, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? My father, first of all, he's got many servants, and they have plenty. They are blessed. They've got an overflowing cup. So what does this tell you? It means his father obviously has a great estate that he would need many servants, and they were hired servants. These aren't slaves. These are people paid for their services. The father's got some substance. He grew up in a blessed house. 
There is substance involved. Uh, it all implies a great deal of wealth. And even though you might not consider yourself rich, you are. Yes, you are. Very rich. So the prodigal son, the point is he came from a place of great blessing. He, he came from his father's house, but he was unhappy. He was unhappy with the structure, unhappy with the rules of the house, unhappy with the control, the oversight, the requirements. And you know, there's something about that world that just wants to keep enticing us and drawing us. The world, the world keeps inviting you. And you know what? There's something also in us that we have to guard against because inherent in you is this desire to fit in and to be like everybody else. I want to be like, I want to be accepted. Who are you being accepted by? Goofballs. Clueless goofballs. I mean, clueless. But this is, is this enticement to be like everybody else. I want to be like my friends. You know, they don't have no stupid rules. They have more fun. So the prodigal son, enticed by all of that, abandons the structure, the rules of the father's house. And seeks the pleasures that the world has to offer. Now, we know part of that pleasure, we read it in verse 30, was harlot. You know, he spent all his money on harlots, the older brother said. So, you know the decadence, the immorality. I can't stand this place no more. i got to get out of here. And that brings me to another very important point about a parallel I see here between the prodigal son and Americans. The feeling of entitlement. Why do you feel like this prodigal son? I mean, if, if you look, if you look at it, why does he feel so entitled to to his father's goods, his father's money, his father's things? Why is he so entitled? Did he work hard to earn it? Did he really discipline himself to to make to make all it? No, he felt entitled just because. I'm an American. I deserve it. I was born there. I have a right to it. I have a right to it. I'm owed. Now, I want to tell you, they, they say that this particular society, this, this particular generation calls itself or is known by the entitled generation. Uh, we're, we deserve it. We have a right to it. Or, or how about like uh, we read over here in verse 12. Y'all still with me right there? Yes. Verse 12, the younger said to his father, Father, give me. Give it to me. I want it. Give it to me. I demand it. I demand it. I demand you owe me. That's entitlement. That's exactly what entitlement is. So, I can draw a few parallels here. The fact that we are privileged. We are living in a blessed nation like the prodigal son. Some parallels between the prodigal son and the United States of America. We, we grew up in a blessed land. You know, people want to come here. Believe it or not, people want to come to the United States. And not too many want to leave here and go, you know, I think I'd like to leave here and go live in Saudi Arabia. That's what I think I'd like. To I'm going to go live over there in Kuwait. I'm going to go live over there in Iraq. That's what I'm going to do. I can get land cheap. <laughs> Syria, I, I mean, you can buy a nice building in Syria for, I mean, cheap, cheap. You can retire there. People don't do that. No, they want to get on a raft and come here from Cuba. They'll, they'll float over here on an inner tube if they can. People want to come here. Why do, you think, why do you think that? It's because they know, the world knows 
America is blessed and blessed in a unique way. Do we have problems here? Many, many problems. But despite the problems, it remains a land of opportunity, a land of growth, and where they know they can come and that they could have a chance here. They could have a chance here that they can't have elsewhere. You know, there's a passage over in Psalms 33. I'm, I'm going to turn over there and read it. Keep your finger here if you're turning with me, because I'm coming right back to Luke 15. But I want to read a passage from Psalms 33. I do believe that God has blessed this nation, that he has blessed us and blessed us and continued to bless us. And oftentimes, like the prodigal son, we are ungrateful and rebellious. Psalms 33, one verse, just one verse. Blessed is the nation, verse 12. Psalms 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Now, this Old Testament passage, you read it, and automatically you assign it to Israel. But that would be, that would fall short of what this passage is actually saying. Because the word nation here, blessed is the nation, this word, it, it can refer to Israel, but most commonly it refers to Gentiles. In fact, this word, nation, is translated heathen or Gentiles 173 times in the Old Testament. Most often, it refers to the nations of the world, just nations, others besides Israel. By the way, Gentiles and heathen, it's the same thing. That's, they, either they were Jews or they were heathen. They were Jews or they were Gentiles, and it's pretty much synonymous. But notice, I believe this is interesting, that God promises blessing upon the nation whose God is the Lord. The Lord there is the Hebrew Yahweh, the, the covenant name of God. So if there is a Gentile nation whose God is Yahweh, blessed is that nation. Blessed. The cursed nations worship false gods. The cursed nations worship idols. They worship gods of their own imagination. People think up their ideas of God. I mean, we're, we're famous for that even here. People think up, well, I don't think God is like that. Well, well this is how the Bible describes it. Amen. Well, that's not the God that I serve. Well, you don't serve God. Yeah, right. You serve an imaginary God. You just made up your own God. <laughs> My God doesn't send people to hell. Well, your God's not real. <laughs> the God, you just made him up. He's a figment of your imagination. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, whose God is Yahweh. Why would they be blessed? Because they would be always under God's watchful eye. That's why. And the God that we are called to serve is, is the real God. Everything else is false. Fantasy, fiction. And if there is anything behind the idols, it's a demon. There is one true God, and he is the God of the Bible. Amen. His laws are good, his commandments are good and just and right. And you know when people follow the laws of God, they're blessed. They're just like the great principles of the Bible. You follow them, the Lord always blesses. He always provides. And he protects. You worship the Lord Jesus Christ. You serve him with all your heart. Doesn't mean you don't go through trial and trouble. 
But through it all, the Lord is with you. And you have that confidence that no matter what storms come and go, the Lord's with you through it all. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter how hard the wind blows, even if the ship is sinking, you are not sinking with it. And when he goes on and says in this psalm, and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Well, the Bible often calls Israel God's heritage. But what we see here is that the people whose God is Yahweh, all the people whose God is Yahweh are blessed right along with those of Israel who are faithful. If you are faithful. And, and, and my, my whole point in this is just for us to know God has blessed America. God shed his grace upon thee, the, the song says. And despite all of our shortcomings and all of our failures as a nation, and look, there are many. This country is far from perfect. But the fact that God has blessed America is undeniable. I want you to think about just a few things this morning because I think this will help us not only to make my point that America is a lot like this prodigal, but, you know, we are one of the largest countries in the world, one of the largest. Uh, from sea to sea, east to west, gulf on the south, a, a vast land, a diverse land, and a blessed land, so rich in natural resources. You know, not all countries have what we have. They don't have this much land, and even when they do have that much land, a lot of it is barren, uninhabitable wasteland. Australia is huge, but the vast majority of it is wasteland. There are other great large countries. I mean, Saudi Arabia is huge. It's all desert. The fact that we're one of the largest countries in the world with tremendous natural resources is a picture of God's blessings. Great fields, huge plains, uh, perfect for growing grains of all kinds. You ever drive through some of the corn country or grain country? It goes on and on and on. It's just like, how big, how big this land is. And then we've got forests. Great forest, I mean perfect for all the lumber, the trees, for building. We've got the perfect stone for building. We've got ore. We've got soil so rich that we not only feed our nation, we feed much of the world. How blessed is the United States of America? We don't have to depend on other nations to feed us. Look, a lot of countries do. They, they have to buy their grain or buy their food supplies from others. We have, we have great land for cattle of all kinds. We really are a blessed country. And especially think about this, too. We really do have an agreeable climate. Not every country has that. And even though we get a little hot and sweltery down here, it's not 140 degrees like in the Saudi Arabian desert where absolutely nothing can grow. Our climate is agreeable for growing crops all year round in different parts of the country. None of this, none of this, I believe, by accident. I do believe the Lord blessed this country, blessed it in, in many, many, many ways, and I don't believe that all of us really fully understand just how blessed America is. Despite its shortcomings, it's still a land of opportunity. People want to come here because they believe that they can find here a better life, a safer life. If they apply themselves, if they're diligent, if they work hard. And look, this nation was largely built by immigrants. People who came here looking for a better life, a better place to live. And they weren't afraid to work. They had a work ethic. They worked. They saved. And they made, they made this country the greatest industrial nation on earth. 
And it still remains a leader in world technology. We've got these huge oceans on each side full of sea life, the great gulf below us. We're blessed. We are a blessed people. Uh, And you know, if you think back, if you were... If you're fortunate enough to have known your grandparents, you know, by and large, our forefathers were hardworking, honest people. They didn't come here looking for a handout. They came here looking for an opportunity to work and to make a living and to provide for their family and to have a safe place to live. This is what people all over really want, just an opportunity to work, to earn a living, to have a safe place to live, to raise my family. That's what people want. And they want that all over the world. But they can't have it in many parts of the world. I'll tell you something else. That many of the people who forged America's original documents, while they were not all born-again Christians... They did have a basic Christian outlook on life, on morality, on ethics, on government. And that really set the course for America's trajectory. The Declaration of Independence, a a, a very profound document, says that all men are created equal. That is profound. And it's profoundly true. It's biblical. All men are created equal. And that they've all been endowed by their creator, acknowledging the creator, with certain inalienable rights, among which are life and liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's really, it's really a profound document that I believe has its basis in biblical principles, that all men are created equal. You know, in the United States of America, a poor man, his word is supposed to be just as good as a rich man's word. A man who owns nothing, his word should be just as valid as a rich man's word, who owns many things. If we're all equal, now the Bible says God's not a respecter of persons, so we should not be either. Rich or poor, black or white, male or female, educated or illiterate, all men are equal. Because of those founding Fathers and documents, America, I believe, has flourished. Shortcomings to be sure. But you know, people know they can come to the United States. And even though it's considered a Christian nation, now now personally I believe it's far from a Christian nation, but they consider it a Christian nation around the world, you can come here and nobody's going to force you to be a Christian. You won't be coerced to go to church. Uh, You can come here. Even if you don't worship the God of the Bible, you'll be accepted as an equal citizen with equal rights, equal opportunities. It's a unique land because this isn't true in every part of the world. Now, all of these rights, the equality of all, Of course, we believe it should be extended to the unborn as well, that they too have a right to life, the right to life, a fundamental right, a fundamental right of our Declaration of Independence, a right to life. America has many weaknesses and failures and shortcomings, but these blessings upon our country, despite its weaknesses, it's made it a world leader and one of the great superpowers in all the earth. If only we would use the great influence we have for good. And that reminds me of a great 
biblical principle that Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and verse 48. He said, to whom much is given. To whom much is given, much is required. Much is given, much is required, much will be required. America will be held responsible for what it's been given, its privileges, its freedoms, its blessings. The Williams translation of that passage in Luke 12 48 says, much will be demanded from anyone to whom much has been given. Yes, people will demand much more from anyone to whom they have entrusted much. God has given us much. And I was making the illustration how America is much like the prodigal son because I want us to, to go back to that thought. The prodigal son was self-willed, selfish, rejecting the father's laws and rules and morals and restraints, choosing to abandon the father's house to go live life like the heathen, in drunkenness, in immorality, in revelry, uh, much like the prodigal much like the prodigal son. But we know how the prodigal son turned out. You, you still have your finger over there in Luke, Luke's Gospel, chapter 15? Then, then let's look over here again briefly. Here's how the prodigal turned out. Let me just remind you. Verse 15. Well, He, he says, verse 13, he went to a far country. He's got all of these great resources, this great inheritance, this great heritage, this great wealth. And he went to a far country and wasted his substance with riotous living. Wasted. He squandered everything he had. This is where we get the idea of prodigal. It means to be a, a waster, uh, to be self-indulgent and irresponsible. This is what he did. He wasted it all on riotous living. And when he spent everything, boy, you can go through money pretty quick, living riotously. There arose a mighty famine, and he began to be hungry. He began to be in want. And what is he going to do? He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and the guy said, you want a job? Go feed my pigs. That's about the worst thing you could do to a Jew, you know, send him to go work in a pig pen. And so, verse 16, he would have filled his belly with the husks, fighting the pigs for husks. And no man gave unto him. There was no social agency to help him out. Nobody giving him a bed and a sandwich. You know, I could make a point here about how we have to even be wise when we give to some of these uh, agencies that we don't enable people to continue to live a pig pen lifestyle because they're down and out in drugs and, and alcohol and we give them money, you help them buy alcohol. You help them, you help them live that lifestyle. What if people had started giving this guy money in the pig pen? Look, you're hungry? Here's a sandwich. You come to me, I'll give you a sandwich a day. He could stay in the pig pen for quite a while. So we have to be wise because at the same time, we want to help the poor. But we want to help the poor who are willing to be helped and who really want to rise out of the, you know, out of despair and out of the pig pen because... We, we know that people can be helped out of the pig pen when they want to be helped. But we also can't enable those who are happy to stay right there. You keep buying them wine, they'll stay. But it doesn't work out well for those in rebellion towards God or towards the Father's house. Verse 17 says, He came to Himself. That's what we have to do as a nation. We have to do that personally, but we also have to do that as a nation. We've got to wake up. 
wake up and, and realize we're in the pig pen right now. I mean, look around you. America is broken. America is in trouble. America is so deeply divided, more so today than at any time, perhaps since the Civil War. The divisions are deep and the anger is deep. I do believe that it's time for America to come to himself and realize, you know, we were so blessed. We, and we are still blessed to be here. The, the answer, the solution is not to destroy what we have, but to fix what's broken. And there is plenty broken. There is plenty that's broken. But the answer is to return, to return to the Father. Years ago, the pilgrims, many of the pilgrims, the early, the early settlers who came here, the colonists, you know why they came here? They were running from the oppression of kings and popes. They were running from the oppression of kings and popes. Because in Europe, there were great inquisitions, there was horrible, horrible uh, poverty, no opportunity to advance, to, you were stuck in a caste system with the blue bloods and the princes uh, just dominating and ruling over all, and then the oppression of popes. They came here seeking religious freedom, they came here seeking a land where they could be free. To worship God. And originally, with these settlers, you know, they didn't even want Roman Catholics coming here. Uh, it was 30 years after Jamestown was settled. It was 30 years before they allowed Roman Catholics to come and settle. And when they settled, they settled in a place they called Maryland. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And they didn't want them coming here because they knew their allegiance to the Pope and they knew their superstitions and they knew their idolatries and they knew that the Pope was the oppressor of all. They wanted to run from that. And the laws that they established, well, most of them were according to biblical guidelines that would maintain a morality, a lifestyle of work and reward. It rewarded work, but it didn't reward sloth. And there would be punishment if there were lawbreakers, but it was said that in the new world, men would be equal. Unfortunately, in the new world, it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. It didn't take long before injustices rose up. And look, it doesn't take long. You know the history of America. You know that they began very early importing slaves. Uh, and not everyone who was given the task of enacting justice, not everyone who was given that task was just Amen. or moral or good. And America has suffered as a result. But the answer is to return to the Father. The answer is to say, you know, I was so blessed. It was better before. <laughs> when, when we were under the Father's blessing, injustices remain, and it's up to wise men to repair those injustices. And, and I pray that, that America is wise and comes to itself and returns to its foundations, the, the, the wise foundations of many of the founding fathers. If we returned to the father, you see what happened with the prodigal son? He arose, he came to his father in repentance. I have sinned against God, I've sinned against you. Just think if there was wide scale people repenting across America. I've sinned against God. And they return to God in prayer and repentance. I mean, what a blessing. Here's what the father did. He hugged him. He put 
He put the robe on him. He put the ring on his finger. He put shoes on his feet. He killed the fatted calf. It'd be blessing. This, this speaks to me like a great revival, you know, that, that God would grant great revival. We, we need the revelation, though, of the prodigal son. When his eyes were opened and he said he came to himself. Don't we want to pray God open the eyes of our nation and help us to see? Because America has tripped and fallen. We've chosen filth and depravity and ungodliness and pagan lifestyles over a Christian lifestyle. See, here's my concern. That instead of being like the prodigal son, that America has become more like Absalom. Hey, you remember who Absalom was, right? Yeah. Absalom, what a difference this is. See, the prodigal son came to himself and returned to his father, repented of his sins. Absalom, on the other hand, rebelled against his father. Absalom was King David's son. And King David's son, instead of repenting of his sins, he went to war against his own father. He went to war against his own father, brought destruction upon himself and upon all who followed him. It didn't end well for Absalom. It ended well for the prodigal son who woke up, came to himself, repented of his sins, returned to his father. Absalom instead was destroyed. And his father wept because God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. A best case scenario for the United States of America is that like the prodigal son, we have revival, we come to ourselves, we wake up, we turn to Christ with all of our hearts. We abandon a wicked lifestyle of rebellion and sin and ungodliness and immorality because I'm going to tell you, America is falling fast into a place from which there will be no coming back if she doesn't turn quickly. There will be no coming back. Like Absalom, we have gone to war against God. Our nation is at war against God. Our nation is at war against God. Right now, we're in trouble. We're at war against God. And unless we return with all of our hearts as a nation, then like Absalom, the result won't be good. The prodigal son didn't just say, I know what I should do. But the Bible says, verse 20, Luke 15, he arose, he came to his father. He arose and came to his father. He didn't just say, I know what I should do. I know what I need to do. No, he actually did it. He got up, he went to his father, and he repented. And, and he was restored. God help America. Amen. God help us. Because if you too have strayed like a prodigal, wandered, yeah. squandered, yeah. wasted, yeah. slipped into a self-indulgent and decadent lifestyle, then it's not too late for you to return to the Father. Amen. It's not too late until it's too late. It's not too late. Even, I don't believe it's too late for America. But I'm concerned, I'm deeply concerned, because I believe we are nearing the point of no return. Amen. So I would, I mean, I would encourage us all to pray for our country, pray seriously for our country. I mean, I can't help but see all the things going on as God sending warning after warning after warning. I mean, if I think God's mad with America, uh, I, I think California keeps getting worse and worse. They get more and more ungodly, passing these crazy laws that are going to allow child molesters to not be branded as sexual uh, as sexual deviants. The stuff that they're putting on television. I, I mean, I would look at all of those fires. And think that maybe God's mad. But then we need to look at what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. And in the Atlantic Ocean and wonder. 
hey, New Orleans, Gulf Coast, in fact, entire United States. I don't believe God's happy with America. We're a prodigal son. We are a prodigal son that's right now in the pig pen. And God is sending warning after warning for us to wake up, repent, get right. While you're still a prodigal, get right. Because once you become an Absalom, it's too late. God have mercy. God have mercy. Father, we pray today that you would have mercy on our nation, have mercy on our land. Lord, we pray that you would pour out a spirit of repentance. We pray, Lord, that like the prodigal son, you would cause this nation to wake up, to remember its heritage, its blessing, its founding documents, and the God, the God that America once served. Lord, I pray for this land. I pray for those who are in authority here, all who are in leadership here. I pray you give them moral conviction. I pray you convict them personally of their own sins and that you grant great repentance across America. Lord, let us raise our voices. I pray that you raise prominent national voices that could speak, that could speak to the heart of Americans, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you bring conviction, that you, re- that you bring repentance, and that you bring revival across this land. I pray, Lord, that you continue to preserve even as you warn, even as you chastise. Remember mercy, we pray. Lord, have mercy on all, all who hear my voice today and all who hear this message Have mercy on one and all. Let us turn to you with our whole hearts. Lord, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. God have mercy. God have mercy.